I thought I'd do a quick uh, unboxing of Balance of Powers. This is the latest release from Compass Games. Uh, it just showed up in my mail today. Um, pretty quickly, they said they were going to start shipping them on April 28th through 29th, and uh, today's the 30th, so it got here pretty quick. They either had a real short list of pre-orders to ship it to, or they're much more efficient than GMT or MMP, which sometimes take like two weeks to get all their orders out, so I'm guessing probably the former. There's probably not as many orders for them to fill as uh, someplace like GMT, which has usually in the 700 range of uh, pre-orders. Probably not as many for Compass, but um, this looked real interesting to me. I, I didn't know anything about it until uh, just a couple of months ago, um, and uh, I was intrigued by the... Uh, First of all, a World War One strategic level game. Um, I did just do a uh, another unboxing of another sort of World War One strategic bit of a Grail game. Uh, that was AWE's La Grande Guerre. Um, but in terms of um, other World War One era titles that I have that are actually strategic. Um, I don't believe I actually have any. Uh, I've got some, plenty of operational. The, the 1914 series from uh, GMT is operational World War One. <clears throat> the uh, Glory's End when Eagles Fight dual pack there is uh, also more of an operational level game covering the eastern and western fronts uh, as individual um, sort of games. It's a two pack, so there are two individual games there of uh, operational level. World War One. I, um, I also have looking at my shelves here um, the Guns of August from the old. That's the old Avalon Hill game, and that is um, strategic level, but uh, felt kind of limited to me in terms of things like diplomacy and <clears throat> and uh, Chrome. It's not what I would call a Chrome intensive game. Uh, then of course there's the grand operational World War One, which is the SPW uh, Derweltkrieg series, which covers the whole thing. Uh, with the grand campaign, adds some more chromy bits to that, um, adding some of the strategic level type stuff to it, even though the scale of the game is largely um, operational. So, so I don't have a a true strategic <clears throat> World War One. Uh, game that I've uh, gotten to know very well, so um, I thought this would be interesting. Uh, I liked the art design for it. It's a Mark Mahaffey design, uh, very polarizing. People either seem to love him or hate him. Um, I'm actually one of the few who comes down in between. He makes uh, some really interesting maps <clears throat> um, in terms of of color choices and textures and things like that. Uh, and some can be very interesting, and I think it adds a certain level of, uh, of I don't know, I wouldn't say risk, but a certain level of experimentation maybe to the typical stodgy old war game art design, <clears throat> uh, which usually is a slave to function, um, often by necessity. But he'll do some different things, uh, some which work and some which don't. Uh, for example, I'd say his map for the Dark Valley is very good uh, for um, World War II East Front. Um, I thought it was functional uh, as well as aesthetically pleasing, whereas something like 1805 Sea of Glory, uh, it's certainly an interesting map, uh, but really fails the function and legibility test. He, you know, put too many period flourishes in there, which there's nothing wrong with period flourishes in a map. I tend to uh, like them for creating a sense of um, continuity within the game, uh, a sense of, of um, aesthetic theme for the game, which I think is important for war games, which can otherwise be very CRT and hex and numbers based. Uh, they can kind of lose a connection to the period of history that they're representing. Um, so that's usually okay. The problem with 1805 Sea of Glory was that it fell prey to one of uh, Mahaffey's more frequent 
problems, which is very murky and non-contrasting color use. Uh, a lot of his maps tend to be very dark. Uh, the colors tend to be kind of um, muted and blended, uh, and can tend to blend into each other. And the end result is you have a map that looks like you're looking at it through a very murky, almost opaque filter. Um, so not always the best for war game design. Uh, another good map of his is, and let me see if I can find it, should be, there it is, with the MMP games, uh, Kingdom of Heaven uh, is another one of his maps, and that was one uh, where it didn't suffer from that murky uh, uh, kind of illegibility. But uh, the one big failing of the Kingdom of Heaven map is that there's no key on it, um, which makes it difficult to figure out what your uh, different terrain types are, usually. Um, you want to have the terrain on the map uh, easily accessible, uh, instead of having to guess or, or refer to the rule book. So anyway, he did the, the graphics, uh, I think both the map and the counters, which is I think good for a sort of aesthetic uniformity in games to have the same artist do the uh, map as does the counters. Um, sometimes, all too often, you frequently get artists who use the, uh, who do the map and then a different artist will do counters and sometimes the two don't marry up uh, in terms of, of aesthetic look and feel. So you get a very, you definitely get a sense that this game was pieced together by different artists. So it's nice when there's a bit of uniformity in graphic design. Uh, as for the cover, I don't know if if uh, Mahaffey did the cover or not. Uh, this title with the the two fonts here and then this kind of uh, scripty font for the of and balance of powers. Uh, these fonts appear on the counters, so um, I'm not sure. Maybe Mahaffey did do the cover for this. Uh, either way, I think it's a fairly handsome cover. It's definitely an interesting... I haven't seen this kind of cover used in a World War One game before. Usually it's going to be something showing trenches or tanks or, uh, you know, old photographs, uh, World War One photographs of soldiers marching or, um, you know, any number of odd, odd other martial kind of themes. But here, uh, you've actually got one of the Zeppelins over the London skyline, uh, which I thought was interesting. And it's very striking because of this bright spotlight coming from the lower left here, shining onto the white of the Zeppelin. Um, it's kind of a unique looking uh, art style, but very appropriate for the period, I think. It feels very much like a 19, uh, you know, 1914, 1918 period picture, although I don't know what the actual picture is or when it was actually painted. Um, Nonetheless, I, I like it just because of its unique look in a World War I game. Um, and then on the back, your typical boilerplate type stuff. Sample of the counters. And a uh, obligatory World War I photograph. And then layout of the map and so forth. And then your playing time, complexity, solitaire, chart, and so forth. Um, so we'll open up the box. see what we've got inside. Nice uh, color rules book on good color but not glossy paper, which I like. So um, sort of a flat matte type finish and it's in full color, glorious full color and it is very thick. It looks like it's got the scenarios and the rules, 64 pages. Um, sure terrain effects chart on the back of the manual. Don't don't like it when they throw frequently referred to charts in the back of the manual though, because uh, you all too often end up um, having to keep flipping your manual over. It's nice if you just have another separate card so you can leave the manual open to uh, pages that you might be referring to in the rules. So, um, general layout, very nice um, paper quality, although, you know, when you get a rule book this thick, um, it's sometimes not going to lay open as well on your, uh, early pages, you know, when you get to the middle, times it'll lay open pretty well, because 
you've got heavy pages on either side of the center. So, uh, but I do like the color, very good, vibrant printing. Um, I don't see any of the printing problems that GMT uh, color manuals have suffered from of late, where you get one page that's all kind of washed out and faded, and another page that looks normal. Um, GMT's had some hit or miss on their color uh, color manuals and scenario books of late. Uh, hopefully, they've that's something that they've addressed and uh, um, improved upon in recent months. Um, so good color examples and stuff. I like that kind of thing. Um, the paper quality, not super. Um, it doesn't feel quite as heavy as something like a GMT, or not a GMT, uh, something like the MMP uh, Gamers rule books, which are that really thick, good heavy paper. Um, this stuff's a little bit thinner. So all the scenarios laid out in the back. Um, and there is an index, so that's good. A lot of times these rule books are missing the indexes. I'm not sure why they didn't do two separate books, maybe because of the color printing. Um, would have been too expensive to do both. Uh, but very handsome printing. Uh, paper quality could be a little bit better, but um, I'm not going to complain about it since it's not glossy. Um, the worst thing you can do is print you know, usually color ends up on glossy because I don't know if glossy is cheaper or what or easier to do color on. Don't know, but glossy is terrible. Um, so some of the the MMP full color manuals, like for um, Kingdom of Heaven, for example, was that glossy paper. Uh, GMT's color books recently have moved to that kind of real thin glossy paper that's uh, that just kind of crinkles in. You know, if your hands are have, have any moisture on them at all. Um, it'll just cause the paper to immediately start crinkling, um, which is terrible. So, always keep flat matte paper, even if you're going to be colored. Um, whoop, losing my focus here. Here's the player aid cards. Um, well, there's the terrain effects. I'm just not using the iconography, I guess. So maybe they did put it on a separate card instead of it only being on the back of the manual. So that's a good sign. Sequence of play. Resource points. So forth and so on. Second card looks like random events tables. Muster tables. Or neutral entry. Oh, there's a full, full iconography terrain effects chart. Interesting. Yeah, so there is. There's a non-graphic terrain effects chart, full graphic terrain effects chart, terrain effects chart on the back of the manual. So no shortage of terrain effects then. So as my earlier criticism stands uh, contradicted. Um, this is a second. Player aid card. We have here general record track. So it looks like this will be tracking turns and all your other kind of things that you'll need to keep track of. A couple of dice. Counter sheets. These counters were roundly criticized on uh, Consum World. Um, I didn't think they were that bad. Um, some of the textured backgrounds on them were a little concerning. Uh, just because I don't think it helps on a surface as small as a half-inch counter um, to have that kind of, to have any kind of texture. Um, but these look pretty clear and legible to me. Uh, there was a concern about having the yellow versus white numbers. Um, not exactly the most discernible difference in colors there. Um, and some of them I can't... There was some criticism of drop shadows, but uh, the effects of the drop shadows has been pretty minimized on here. And then much, much, much criticism of the little sort of eye silhouettes of the uh, generals along with the weird 
cursive script in the background of their name, which just looks like gibberish. Um, you know, no need at all for the the cursive script behind the names. I'm not sure what it adds to the counters, except that it makes every name look like it has some kind of illegible gibberish behind it. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think it's here. Like the German counters have this texture on them, which uh, you know, I don't know why you would want to add that. It adds more visual noise to counters that are already small enough. Um, but you know, for the most part, they seem pr perfectly legible to me. Um, you know, and there's the typical grognard bitching about, oh, helmet silhouettes on a strategic level game. It's bullshit. Uh, you know, who cares? <laughs> you know, if you want to show a soldier-related counter, why not put a helmet on it? It doesn't bother me any. Um, so, you know, most of those people doing that kind of bitching are people that aren't happy with anything except whatever SPI produced in 1978. So, uh, there's just no pleasing them. Um... More looks at the counters here. And I don't see, it looks like there's four counter sheets. Um, one of my other complaints though, this, whatever color this is, chartreuse or something, it's, <laughs> this is not a good um, color <laughs> to use in a war game um, because it is so noisy to the eye, um, very clashy feeling. Uh, but, you know, depending on how the map is colored, it may work out. I just, I think it's just an ugly color. Um, not necessarily uh, inappropriate for wargaming specifically, um, but it does tend to, it's not what I would consider a usual color for wargaming, so in that sense, um, it's, I don't know what you would call it, non-traditional, not necessarily inappropriate, but uh, a very non-traditional wargaming color, um, which is kind of assaults the senses a little bit too much um, for what you'd expect to look at in a military-related map. Um, and then here's all your various markers. Um, and again, none of them, these uh, run the risk of being a little too visually noisy to be, to, to be easily read. Um, like their control counters but you know they keep the, the design of them is in keeping with the design of the game overall with your rule book and potentially with your map Oop, extra map here. um here's the little extra mini maps we've got a complex looking c chart it's kind of like some kind of flow chart determining activity and so forth and then you've got the Africa map um, to handle this stuff probably more abstractly than you will your uh, east and west front and uh, Ottoman front actions <clears throat> within the game. And for the maps, I'm a little short on table space. I may not be able to lay these out <clears throat> completely. Um, this is the Ottoman map. And this one, you can apparently keep these maps all out separate from each other, or lay them out separately from each other. Um, not, you know, they're not restricted to how they're shown on the back of the box, which is kind of the staggered um, layout. You can do them that way, um, but the designer said that that's not a requirement to actually play. So uh, now I actually thought, <clears throat> and again, the map was also roundly criticized for the use of color and oh, the textures are, are too fancy, and, and uh, you know, the, the water blends into the land in some cases, or you've got weird pastels, why, does it, why is the map, the map covered with pastel colors, and all the kind of classic bitching from people who can't accept anything that Redmond Simonson hasn't done. Um, but I actually liked it. The, the map was very appealing to me because it had a certain period look to it, and... Um, some of that's the fonts, some of the textures, um, and I believe, and maybe it wasn't Haffy, maybe the designer had pointed out um, that it was actually based on, even color-wise, was based on a historical map um, from this era. Um, but, you know, where, regardless of where the colors came from, it, it has a very, this kind of coloring to distinguish countries 
works really well for me on a strategic level map. And, uh, you know, the textures I think are great. I think the mountains look good. Um, you know, rivers and things are clear. It's clear what stuff is, uh, you know, where your ports are, your cities, um, roads, lines of communication, whatever the case may be. There's your capitals. So, you know, I think it's clear. Uh, the, the, the details are clear that the, the um, terrain's clear. And it is good. It's glossy, but um, good heavy stock on the map. And last section here. There you've got the Russian Empire in the yellow. Germany, kind of a gray color. Austria, Hungary, and your chartreuse. And so, you know, those counters do match that color. And again, if that color was borrowed from the historic map, and I, I'm fairly certain in the CSW discussion that they, they pointed out the differences, uh, or the, the connection of this particular map design to an historical map from the era, um, then hey, you know, using a color appropriate to a map of that era um, is fine. Uh, you know, I think that's a good artistic design choice, a good aesthetic design choice. Um, even if the color may feel particularly jarring uh, to me for a military game, um, you know, if it's if it creates an overall unified aesthetic as opposed to something that's cobbled together, then hey, you know, I'll support the effort, um, even if the color <laughs> is a little bit of an assault on the senses. It's not on the map, um, you know, sort of pink on the map, uh, not that big a deal, it's very muted, very pastel kind of color. But, you know, the counters are going to be this bright, um, hot pink <laughs> color. So that's, again, going to be a little assaulting in the senses. But, again, if it is part of a, you know, design aesthetic choice that fits, that works, that says, that complements uh, all the elements of the game, then, hey, you know, I, I can only say, let's see more of that in Wargame uh, graphic design as opposed to less. So... Uh, and then you've got, you know, again, the fonts all working together um, very well. So it, overall, a very handsome-looking package, I think. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to giving this a try. Uh, I may try it solo first before I um, break it out of the club. But um, either way, I'm very much looking forward to getting this one on the table. Balance of Powers. Check it out.